This is the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast, and I want to talk to you about catching swarms. Today on the podcast, we have Jason Bruns, and he has been on the podcast before. He's an excellent guest, and I invited him back today to talk about swarm catching because that is the sort of season we're in right now, and there are a lot of people that have a lot of questions about how to catch swarms and how to uh, make up swarm traps, and so let's get right into it. Welcome, Jason. Hi, Solomon. Thanks. So why don't you start with well, I've in the past I've done a little bit of swarm trapping. I'm actually it seems better at catching swarms in empty equipment sitting in the yard, but I have put up swarm traps before and caught some. So why don't you just tell us what you do and uh, we'll go from there. Well, uh, back in 2011, I started uh, building uh, swarm traps. That year, I built 15 of them uh, because I had purchased some bees and they their performance was a lackluster and I had uh, sourced some bees out of an old whiskey barrel and no matter what I did to them they just they made it through and they were feral there's uh, in the area where I live there's pockets of feral bees around and where that barrel came from there is a pretty good uh, genetic line of bees that I catch there frequently and uh, they just they they live and they I don't have to feed them or treat them, so I wanted to start uh, catching those catching those bees because they were prevalent. I was seeing swarms; they were getting into people's houses. So I built 15 of those traps and uh, caught 14 swarms the first year, just based off of a book I read uh, that I got off of uh, Amazon. So what do you load those traps with? I I load them with one piece of old black brood comb uh, that you want to have about 70% worker nice good propolized worker comb in uh, I then place the rest of the frames uh, those are filled out with foundationless frames and in that I, I uh, on top of the frames I will put one of my little baggies that I put LGO in uh, and then that's pretty much the way I, I bait every single one of them uh, there's no mystery, man. It is super easy. So just plain lemongrass oil? Just lemongrass oil. I bought a, uh, a quart of it. A quart? Or I'm sorry, I bought a pint of oh, it. It okay. was a pint. That's still a lot. Well, I bought a pint of it back in 2011, and I'm still, I've used very little. You know, every single one of those baggies I put anywhere from, I've, tested around with as few as four and as many as 12 and if I, I like a number around eight if you do that in that number I can't see any benefit from any more or any less from all these years of doing this uh, but it that's all it takes and I have even quit refreshing them in the you know throughout the course of the season I leave them up and uh, I don't even go back to them I've got all of uh, most of my hosts with the exception of a few, trained to when something happens, they send me a text message or they'll send me a Facebook message, and I'll go and uh, pick the dang things up. Okay, so I'm told that location mix is very important, that swarms will often go back to the same tree. Well, new swarms will come back to the same trees year after year. Do you find that to be the case? I do find that it's repeatable almost every year. Uh, when I find a, a good tree, uh, that's something that, you know, people really get discouraged with swarm trapping. They, they try it. They might build one or two traps, and they go out there, and, and they put it up, and they leave it in one place all summer, and for some reason, it, it doesn't take a hit, and they get discouraged, and they walk away from it. Um, I mean, really, if you want to do it, say if you wanted to have five hives, I would say buy five, find a way to build five swarm traps. 
and and get them out there in varied locations because you don't know where they're going to be at. There are some locations that I have never been able to trap bees there, so I quit trapping there. But as as I'm doing that, I move around, and all at once you catch something awesome in a place that might have been right under your nose. It's it's uh it it is really you know you talk about making beekeeping fun. It is it is what it, one of the things that makes beekeeping the most fun for me, because you never know what you're going to find, and then once you get these bees. They just survive, and they do all of the things that we're wanting to do in a treatment-free beekeeping regimen. Uh, they're just—it's really the only way to be successful that I've found so far. Awesome! I've had—I had back in Arkansas. I had this one tree in the neighbor's field, cow pasture, uh, in a fence row. That every year that I put a trap up there, I caught a swarm. And there were many other locations that I tried that didn't work, but that one always did. I I have particular locations that I always hang two traps in these people's yards, and I've got I've gotten it up to where there's about uh, five or six places now that I put two traps there because there's very uh, good numbers of of bees in those locations. And they are so repeatable. They come to the same two trees, and I can catch bees on consecutive days, ten feet apart, uh, in in separate trees. And it really makes it worth driving to them. And you don't find that out unless you really kind of get out there. And it really makes it nice. I use it as a way to kind of network with some of the people I work with, uh, kind of get them interested in bees. Uh, it I I get it. Uh, I find a lot of my people I put these traps on are my honey customers so it 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 just helps with building your community and uh it also helps in building a customer base because around work i'm known as the crazy guy who catches bees and i'm always hitting people up for for new trapping locations so uh i mean a lot of people contact me with questions about you know where do you put the things and i say you put them up anywhere you can you know you you try to think of places where there could be good bee habitat where you live and then you try to think of some friends that live there and uh, maybe see if they wouldn't be interested in, in uh, hanging one of these out. Almost, I have never had anybody that I've hung a swarm trap on especially if they've gotten and they caught bees uh, you know th the next year they're asking me when I'm gonna bring the trap out so I mean, it really helps, and then uh, those people are your are really good ambassadors for getting other trapping locations because they talk to their friends, and they're also good at getting you customers for honey too. It it makes it easy to sell out when you when you get out there and get in your community, and that's another thing that swarm trapping does for you. How do you find new hosts other than just at work? Um, well. I over the last five years, I mean, I'm pretty vocal about beekeeping. Pretty much, if there is uh, a question about a bee that goes through my place of employment, they are eventually referred to me, and they are they'll either get to, uh, in contact with me through email or call me, and uh, that that you know a lot of people. Uh, last year, I actually caught a swarm at work. Uh, it had landed in a in a tree, and one of my technicians had come in and said it was in a tree. I had no equipment there or anything, so I called a friend. He came in, and I went out and helped him hive it. And uh, now pretty much the maintenance people keep an eye out for me. I've worked in the same place for going on. I've just been there 15 years, so I know a lot of people. And uh, uh, anybody sees a bee, I hear about it, and I get – now, uh, a, a couple of, of the people I work with are real tech savvy, so if I, I'll get pictures of swarms that are places across town, and you figure out where those swarms are, those are trapping locations. Any place you've ever gone and been, you know, inconvenienced to have to go pick a swarm up, put a swarm trap there or in a location close to that. After that, it's not an emergency. You don't. It, I mean, it, it it adds a little bit of stability to your beekeeping life because 
you can go set this out. You know bees are in the lo in that location. You know that they're going to swarm. If you can put a trap up in a, in a location like that, so when you're picking up swarms, go the extra mile to to befriend the people whose whose yard you're in, and you know offer to give them some honey. Get a reason to get back there and try to get your foot in the door and say, hey, you got a nice tree right there. Uh, one of my uh, coworkers, she's a pharmacist I work with. Uh, I actually was in the middle of my shift and I couldn't go get this swarm. So again, I called a friend and he went and picked it up and she was happy to help out, but she was discouraged because uh, my friend trimmed, uh, you know, it's a standard beekeeping practice to trim the branch off and shake them into the box. And she didn't really like that. Uh, it was a very uh, sentimental tree and she didn't know that was going on. She wasn't going to say anything about it. And, uh, but, you know, I was able to say, you know, I can uh, make sure that I don't have to trim anything off. What if I just hung one of my boxes in your yard? And I, I did that with her and I, uh, my friend caught a swarm in her yard. Then two weeks later, I had a swarm trap I had put up right afterwards. I caught a swarm there two weeks later, and then about three weeks after that, I caught another swarm there, and they were all they were all massive swarms. Uh, both of, of the ones that I got out of the deal overwintered, and I took one of them, the last one that I caught, to uh, I you've you've be kept in several different locations. Do you have – have you experienced where you have yards that are just your hardest yards? You just can't seem to keep bees alive there? Yes. I had one uh, to the south of where I lived in Arkansas, which I later found out was right near a commercial queen-rearing operation. And I could not keep – let's see – it was it was about one out of six every winter that would survive there. Well, I have a location that is very close to one of the biggest beekeepers around us. It is the place that has everything bad. I mean, it has varroa mites bad. It has hive beetles horrible. But it's a great location for my pretty much my biggest opportunity on honey, which is the black locust. It is in a phenomenal location for that. Due to the geography of the ground there, it's down in a depression. So a lot of times when we get bad winds and stuff, the the storms won't knock the blooms out there. So hives there that can live, I I will get four or five medium supers full of of nice white capped uh, black locust honey, but due to the fact that this guy is in close proximity i have every horrible thing that is there and uh it is amazing that bees do uh present themselves that can live in those situations and that's the thing that i'm starting to get to with um catching these swarms if you you know you and i've talked about uh catching swarms is like fishing and it makes it a, a really fun when you can get to where after you do this a while, you get yourself out there. You get some confidence doing it. You know, there's a lot of, of stuff out there on the Internet. And uh, here on my webpage here in the next week or so, I'm going to be talking about these boxes that I, I have been putting out. On the Internet, there's all this information that you got to have a swarm trap 12 feet off the ground, 15 feet off the ground. And that may be optimum. But that gets a lot of people to where it discourages them from swarm trapping. Because they can't do that, and I don't know what it is about beekeepers, but they feel that if they can't do it the optimum way, that they can't do it. Yeah, that's and true. I, and I have uh, been uh, I, now. I have eight of these. I one of these old beekeepers that I I I learned so many good things from. I learned last year. He took old ratty boxes and he screwed old bottom boards to them. So when he would get called to swarms. He wasn't screwing around with a loose bottom board on a hive box, and uh, it, it was old ratty stuff, but it was still sound. It would keep bees in, and I I made up a couple of those, and those daggone things, I would have them out on stands, and they kept on catching swarms for me. So if any beekeepers out there have old equipment, 
like you said, you've attracted them to old equipment. Uh, you know, put an old black brood comb in there from a dead out. Get some lemongrass oil and get uh, a Ziploc bag. All this common stuff that you're going to have if you're a beekeeper. And if you have extra stuff that's just sitting around, get it out there. I have uh, I've taken several swarms now. I, uh, several years ago, I flirted around with this idea of these hive stands. And uh, they were just not good for having the kind of weight that these big three deep colonies when I super them up with <laughs> six or seven medium supers, they couldn't handle it and they were toppling over. But they're really good uh, in in uh, places where I can't get a good tree. I will put these on stands and just deploy them out in a in a place. I like to put them on the north side of a building to where they have shade in the middle of the day. And uh, it's amazing those daggone things take swarms. And um, if you live in a, a lot of these people live in places where they're high ag places where you don't have a lot of good trees, that's all the better to catch swarms. I mean, you putting a box out there, that is is a, a huge thing to bees that are living in these monocrop zones and these threatened zones. A, the huge habitat is is the the big thing that's hurting them. They don't have places to go put their nests. So you putting those traps out there, it, it, they're free for the taking. So I'm sorry. I'm I. Uh, it, it is late for me. I've been uh, up all week. I uh, actually caught five this last week. It was the craziest week of in April of my life for beekeeping. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, going in and out here. And I, if I get off topic, I'm sorry about that. But Whew, it's been a crazy week. You're doing fine. You got great information. Um, what about other other questions? Uh, you know, I, I've talked about the hanging, so people don't need to hang them. Uh, if they refer to my website this week, I'll uh, have, be having all kinds of pictures up of these things, catching them on the ground. Uh, What's your website real quick? Uh, Letthembe.com. L-E-T. M B E E dot com. You know, if you just do a search for my name on the internet, you'll you'll come up with Jason Bruns. You'll come up with it. And if you're a beekeeper, be smarter than me. My wife, she puts up with so much. Uh, <laughs> I had about forty of these things all baited up and all within about twenty five feet of our back door, and uh, they've been uh, uh, attracting in heavy scouting. Uh, there's a lot of feral bees that live around me. I just found out about a, a house uh, right behind me. There are some of these people that live around that are salt of the earth people. This guy is a very common man. I know he does not have the internet or a cell phone. I don't even know if he has a phone. But this guy has an old house that he's living in, and he's got bees living in this house, and they have been for 15 years, he says. He's just never done anything about it. He's got a huge gaping hole in the side of his house, and he just puts up with it. And most of the people that live around here wouldn't. And these things are are uh, black. They look like raisins. Those are the those are emerging as as uh, my most productive phenotype of bees that I'm finding around here. Uh, I uh, I love to see those when when uh, when you start catching swarms that are around you. You will, uh, you'll see these differences, and uh, it makes it fun, like you say. So, where you're at, do you? Uh, is there good bee habitat everywhere, or is it in patches? Um, I would tend to say it's more or less everywhere. It's really hard to tell here. I'm where I have my bees up in the Applegate Valley is surrounded on all sides by, um, in in. It just depends on how the distance is, but it's surrounded on all sides by like national forest land and BLM land, and so there's a lot of there's a few things up there that bloom. There are madrone trees, which you don't have there, um, manzanita, uh, various wildflowers, lots of different types of wildflowers. So that stuff's available, and then also in the valleys here we have 
uh, farmland. A lot of hay is grown here in in various places. Um, some other crops. There are melons grown here. Um, kind of like the larger style uh, farm to table type farms. Um, so on that BLM land is. Where is the closest location to you where there would be suitable cavity sizes where bees would would have a likely ability to live there? I know I know of two feral hives within two miles of where my bees are right now that have had bees in them in the past, but don't currently. I went back and checked, and they're gone right now. Not sure why. Um, and I've explored. And you, have, you have hives two two miles from there. I don't have hives. Oh, okay. There, I, okay. mine are only in one spot right now. Okay. But I've also been up in the woods, traipsing around looking for mushrooms and things, and I know there are suitable trees with cavities up there, but I just have not been able to find any bees actually living in them. Well, you don't actually have to find them. I, I, I know it, it's crazy, but what I have found here is I don't have to find them. It's neat when I do, but where I live, if I find a place where bees can live, they're there. I'm very fortunate. I, I live in a. I mean, you would think if you listen to the media, which I, you know, I'm I am not for all for monocrop ag. But you would think that they would all be dead out here. That's what I thought when I first started beekeeping. That's why I got bees. I thought that I needed to buy bees to bring bees here. And there were bees here all along. They're just living a, a, a pretty low-key life and not, not – uh, nobody notices them. Uh, and here, if you find those places – and anybody can do this anywhere where they live, if you can find a place – where you can find cavity sizes and you know take a take when you take a walk out bait yourself or bait some part of you, of you with some lemongrass oil and as you're walking around looking for mushrooms especially this time of year if if you're if you got honeybees there they're going to come around you and mess with you and you're going to know bees are there so then you can start figuring out a plan how you're going to get traps close to that location that's just the way my mind has been working for the last five years. It's uh, that's the that's the kind of stuff I do. I mean, I go around to places. I uh, I put honey out on plates. Pretty much now, Solomon. It's just to me. It's like smallmouth fishing in these creeks here. <laughs> at a certain time, uh, I I know by looking at Google Maps, if I look in a stretch of of habitat, I'm going to be like that. Looks like a a bee place and inevitably I'm going to find bees there now the quality of them might be good it might be bad there's places that that I don't trap anymore uh, and then I focus more on places where these bees I capture them and you know they've been alive since 2011 and never been requeened they take care of that themselves they give me appreciable amounts of honey every single year it just makes it to where I don't have to do a lot except build equipment and and run around all hours of the morning and night uh, moving these traps around. <laughs> Speaking of equipment, what do you what do you say about box size for your traps? Uh, about what? About the size of the box. I really just mainly due to the fact that I had them. I use uh, 10 frame deeps. I only put eight frames in them. I have all this on my website, how, how I build these things. Uh, I reinforce the corners with two by twos because where I live, you can have really heavy swarms. But that book that I read was by a guy named McCartney Taylor. It's a very basic book. I don't know if everybody needs to go out and spend 14 bucks, but if you got an extra 14 bucks, you know, I he earned what what I learned from him. It, it was it was what I needed when I needed to read a book about it because nobody else was really talking about this or giving away how they did it. Um, but thirty five liters seems to be 
a magic number that, that a lot of uh, references I saw are what honeybees look for. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people are using nukes, five-frame nukes, and I understand that they got those around. Uh, and, and you can use those. But, man, I don't know. I, I, I'm very partial to a bigger box size. I've had humongous swarms hit some of my smaller traps and then abscond. Like they couldn't all get in there and then they, they somehow figure that out and leave. I see. So I don't know if that really is what happened. As a beekeeper, you know, you see a big, huge group of bees come and then leave. I really don't know exactly what happened. But I have seen that with these smaller boxes. I have a, a I, uh, I salvaged some shelves out of a house that I lived in back, I don't know, 20 years ago. And, and I made, they're the size of eight frame boxes. And um, they, they hold six frames. And those have been really good, uh, good to me. I've got some, some uh, trap plans that I put up on the internet. And some guys that are from a little bit further south in Indiana, they gave me uh, so the design of how they were you, you know, doing their, their traps. Jason down there, they have got an awesome bee club. They do a lot of bee trapping. Uh, and I believe it's a southeastern Indiana beekeeping club. But they gave me how this one particular guy, and I, I think he, he catches hundreds of, trap, uh, of, of trapped bees every year. And I don't know what he's doing with them all. Uh, one question I've had a lot of people uh, ask me about is attrition rate. You know, how many of these things are you going to have and, and how many of them are going to die? And uh, it's just like anything in beekeeping. You don't know. Uh, as I have done this, I've, I've kind of figured out how to make it to where your chances are better. But, but you have to view it as, you know, you get a package of bees. What are your chances of them overwintering? In my experience, it's not very good. Uh, with these swarms... What I try to do is during the uh, the spring of the year, it's very busy for me. I catch a lot of these things. I'm going to try to catch 25 of them this year uh, before I start farming them out to other people. Uh, but what I try to do is catch as many as I can and then allow the ones that are going to do well to do well. I invest very little time into them. I hive them. And pretty much, I do not mess with them until the next spring. If I notice that they're dead, I'll clean it out before the moths get in there. But I invest nothing else into them. And, and they show me, that, that shows me where my good trapping locations are. And I have started to develop this philosophy in my beekeeping that in order to keep doing this and to keep selling this to my wife, I've got to be productive <laughs> and and I cannot count on unproductive bees to aid me in getting where I want to in my beekeeping. If they cannot take care of what they need to do to overwinter, I really can't invest anything more into them than the shot that I give them with giving them good habitat. Because where I live, you know, people can give all the money they want to to, to quote unquote bees. But bees' biggest problem where I live is habitat loss and basically cavity loss because everything is cut down. And basically by keeping bees and, and doing what I do, which is be a bad beekeeper, by doing something what I call uh, – I contribute back to the feral reserve of bees and I don't feel bad about it. You know, If my bees swarm, you'll never hear me gripe and complain about it. Because the way I look at it is if that goes out there and does find a cavity, one, it could swarm and hit one of my boxes because now I'm actively uh, trying to figure out a way to catch my own swarms. But, you know, if it goes out and replenishes the feral reserve, I mean, that's what I've been using for the last five years. And these bees that escaped from beekeepers 
that were keeping bees back when Varroa came through. That's my theory on on where these bees came from. But these bees are are living around here, and I think that they're living a a lot more u- ubiquitously across the United States than what people even can imagine. And and they have been living since Varroa came through, and they're dealing with these problems, and. If they can handle overwintering, then they can be productive and give you something out of the deal. And it seems to be working for me here. Uh, you know, I'm not quitting my day job or anything, but this is a very fulfilling hobby that, you know, I may catch, you know, to answer some of these people who've asked me about attrition of my hives. This last year I had a really good winter for, for bees and overwintering. It wasn't really bad. Uh, Almost all of mine overwintered. Uh, I seventy percent of my caught swarms overwintered. I have had years where caught swarms. We have a bad winter, and you don't feed them and you don't do anything, and none of your swarms make it. That's only happened one time, and it was two years ago. We had the worst winter in like twenty-five years. I had a lot of established hives die, which is unprecedented. I had fourteen of those die, and it all happened, Solomon, because it got cold for so long that they were unable to break cluster. So I had these cavitations up through my deep, and there was 40 pounds of honey just, you know, four to six inches away from the cluster. But they never were able to break cluster to reorganize that honey and get over to where they could utilize it. So that made me take some changes in my philosophy and my management, and I haven't. I overwintered well last year. I leave a little extra honey on, and I extract it in the spring. But uh, Solomon, I, I've been meaning to ask you: Have you ever heard of permaculture? Yep. I about the time I got into bees, I, I really credit. Uh, I've never taken a permaculture course, but about the time I got into bees. I purchased uh, Bill Mollison's uh, his big text, the the permaculture manual, mm-hmm. and I read that about the same time I was getting into bees, and that's one of the things that really kind of got me in into swarm trapping and trying to use what is here, what is around you, to do what you need to do in beekeeping. That is historically how people kept bees. And, you know, there's people having a lot of trouble keeping bees today. And I believe that that's one of the reasons why they're, they're encountering a lot of the troubles that they, they are. And uh, I, I've, you know, we were talking about potential questions before we, uh, you started recording. And, you know, one question I get a lot from people is, you know, where do you get this old equipment? I get old equipment anywhere I can. I don't keep a lot of frames, but these old boxes, if you can char them, or you know, if they don't look diseased, uh, I don't know. I've never had a problem with disease from boxes. In some parts of the country, that might be a problem, but if you char them, they're going to smell like bees. Even if, even if you wanted to do five uh, swarm traps. If people are going to buy a nuke for 150 or 175 or 185 dollars, one nuke, to me it would be worth going out and buying five brand new boxes, and getting some old propolized nasty comb and getting it soft and rubbing it all over the inside of those boxes, and trying to get them out there, and and try that this spring. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, I mean that. When you look at a, a return on investment, a return on investment of five swarms, okay, I caught five swarms last week. Two of them I think were small, but I do know I would be willing to bet that at least three of them would account for at least six to eight frames of bees, just in bulk of bees that are in there, and and they are, uh, they're making comb because they're loaded up on honey. But... I mean, just to be able to get that, I, I caught five last week, and I just did this passively. I didn't have to drive anywhere. Nobody called me at work, and I had to try to weasel out of work to go pick these things up before they fly away. 
I did this passively. That's something that permaculture teaches. I advise anybody who's in beekeeping to go read about uh, permaculture. There's all kinds of stuff all over the internet about it. Uh, I listen to Permaculture Voices. It's a podcast. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't even ask you if I could plug that. I didn't ask no, them if fine. I could plug it, but it's something I listen to. It's daily. That um, it 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 changed the way I because I started out beekeeping. I was gonna do beekeeping like everybody does. You know, buy bees, buy treatments, do it just like I do at work as a pharmacist. But then you get a little bit of experience. Yeah. With some of these uh, wild-caught bees, and it uh, it really changes your perspective on what their part of the deal is and what your part of the deal is, uh, and it makes beekeeping fun, like what you talk about. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't know. Uh, it, what are, is there anything that we're leaving out? Uh, I had a couple of notes here. Um, oh kind of a simple basic one how do you attach the box to a tree i have a it's actually sitting in front of me right here it's a 15 inch long one by two and i have two holes drilled in it and one hole gets screwed into near the bottom of the side of the box and then i screw another screw up towards the top of the middle of the side of the box and then one big hole in the top and that screws to the tree what do you use what I use now is uh, I used to use a nail, but I uh, I am trying to appeal to a, a, a people letting me put these in their yards in town, and a lot of these people are very attached to their trees. So what I use is some number two chain. I outline all this on my on my website. And um, speaking of which, it, it, I'm going to have all of the. Websites and books and podcasts and things listed in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, uh, you can go to tfb.podbean.com and find the episode, and you can look up all these references. Great, because uh, I want people to get out there and just just try this. Uh, but it, where was I there? I kind of got sidetracked. I started thinking about LGO and uh, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Loading. Um, oh, you were talking about number two chain. Oh yes, number two chain. Uh, a lot of a lot of these people really like their trees. I am. Uh, if you go the extra mile, you can get these traps into places that you wouldn't believe. And if you're not nailing to their trees or screwing to their trees, so I wrap this chain around the tree. And I use S hooks to do that. Outline all this on the on the page. In the sides of my traps, I've got a half inch hole. I run that trap through there, and then I uh, or I run that chain through there and then hook it back to itself. And then I use a, a strap. I I go to a lot of flea markets. That's where I source all these straps because you go to friggin' Menards and start buying straps, you're gonna kill yourself. Uh, on expense, but go to buy cheap straps at at yard sales or uh, flea markets, and that'll keep this trap on on a tree. Uh, a lot of people put nails up there. I see them with their their traps on YouTube, you know, and they're swinging around. I view one of these once they take a swarm as being worth a hundred to hundred and fifty bucks to me. And I want to make sure that when I put it up there, that there's not going to be a failure of the box or the hanging mechanism, because um, that's how I'm doing all of what I'm doing. So they're worth, you know, uh, the extra hassle. Uh, you know, if you're if you're a person that will go spend 125 dollars for a package, how many hours does that take you to work? It doesn't take you that much longer to hang a swarm trap. And I'm not telling everybody they got to go nuts and go out and hang 40 of them like me. Uh, I don't think most people have a wife that is pa as patient as what mine is, so don't try to just jump into that. But know that once you start and you have some success with it and you really start yeah. – what really does it for me, Solomon, is you start finding where these really good bees are and you put them on really good locations and then you have good yield and, and good honey production. And really, 
as opposed to treating your bees and and taking on your bees like it's a healthcare treatment and you're you got bees in a nursing home you're you're dealing with an organism that is uh you know doing what it has always done in its mutualistic relationship with humans and uh i think the best thing we can do with them is is to harness this this you know feral reserve of bees get out there and capture them don't be greedy with them if if uh if you get some bees that get out and swarm uh put up some swarm traps try to catch them and keep them out of your neighbor's houses and stuff but if they get into a tree and you know about it leave them in there that's a a breeding ground for you every time that 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 tree swarms you can get the potential of catching it and every time it swarms it is rebreeding with drones in the area and becoming stronger and better and more suited to the biome that you're living in and that's and, exactly what you want and don't requeen them unless they absolutely need it yep i i know i tell you a lot of i uh that's another thing i wanted to talk about on my notes i had uh i see a lot of people who are talking about their bees being mean and having to requeen them and uh again back to thinking about things in a permaculture i really have no a, a plug to permaculture or affiliation with it never done a pdc so i just uh, want people to learn about it but when you start thinking about bees in permaculture to me it's kind of unfair to take them and and to keep them and to try to exert total dominant control over them and to keep them from you know doing what they want to do pretty much any time i have had mean bees where i live it has been my fault i have done something to cause it whether i've made them queenless from over manipulation that was something the first year that i bee kept i over manipulated you know i was out there once a week like what it read I, in the one book i read about bees uh you know it was it was crazy. I was killing these queens, and then all at once, these bees were mean. And my my wife walks outside, and they're freaking banging her in the head. Uh, over manipulation causes some some bees to get mean. I have noticed that in my beekeeping. Then you're gonna have some bees that that uh, they're a little more wily. And uh, what I try to do with those is if they if there is no other way, I guess requeen them. But what I try to do in looking at the world uh, in a permaculture way, I owe it to those bees to put them out there. Pretty much, I try to let nature decide whether they live or die where I'm at. Uh, if they can overwinter, I try not to cull them. So what I do in, in cases like that is I will move them to a location where it won't be a problem if they're a little mean. And, and those types of bees, historically for me, in those out yards, uh, I'm very fortunate I have some out yards where there are keys and they're gated so nobody can get there unless I unlock the gate and people aren't around them. So I move them to those locations. And um, I go there to super them in the spring and to take honey away. And maybe one time in June or July, to just check to make sure everything's okay. Other than that, I don't even go there. So, and, and a lot of people, the first thing they want to do is requeen those when that could be potentially the most productive bees that they would have. Now, yes, they're not going to want to get in there and work them with no shirt on uh, and no smoke, but there's really no reason to work them. You know, you uh, get in there and do what you need to do, manipulate them if you need to, but then let, leave them to their work. And those bees are always very productive. I've, I've got, uh, I've got a, uh, a hive of bees that I had to do some, uh, some boxes. I, I, when I got into beekeeping, I was really scrapping as much uh, junky material together to get in as big as I could. The first year, you know, you catch 14 swarms thinking you're maybe going to catch one or two. I was grabbing all kinds of ratty old material to, to have boxes made out of. And I had to 
I had to re change out two boxes out of uh, a three deep box or a three deep stack that I have not had the frames apart since 2010. I haven't needed to. Uh, they dissuade me from doing it by by their temperament. Uh, my, my bees here when I get when they get three big massive three deep colony. I believe that they they get the sense they have a have the feeling that uh, they know that they're a they're a bigger organism and they they've I don't know they're a more aggressive hive of bees than they were say their second year when they were a real big healthy two deep colony. Do you see that with your colonies as uh. they grow? They they do seem to have it's not really aggression. I view it as uh, it's not aggression. It's that they know that they don't have to be pushed around. Uh, that's kind of the way I, I get when I am working them. And I, they're more likely to uh, exhibit a defense response because they have more discretionary bees. That's the way I feel when I'm working them. I can tell you that I do know that five-frame nukes are among the most gentle and calm hives that exist. Mm-hmm. Yep, and I don't deal with them. Most of my swarms that I catch are bigger than that when I catch them. But I will, I will hive uh, traps uh, if if uh, you know without with, without protective gear. But most of my bees, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's really just not a good management practice. Uh, you could probably get by with it uh, 99 times out of 100, but where I live, uh, storms come up, and those bees can tell that a thunderstorm's coming before we can. And I've had them get really hot on me on, uh, on approaching thunderstorms. I hear the first cloud of thunder, and I realize that they started getting pissy with me 15 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And it makes me realize that they knew that that was coming, and they, you know, you're working bees trying to get done what you want to get done. The bees did get mean that day, but it was my fault. And a, and a lot of times where I live, that's – I have a occupied swarm trap that I just moved this morning that I said you know was 25 feet from the house. And it has been there all week. Kids going in and out. I've got a three-year-old running around out there, dog, chickens running around. It, they don't bother anybody. Uh, but by the time it's three deeps – I don't know if you'd want it that close to your house. You know what I mean? Yep. Because it's just a lot of bees. Uh, when I swapped those two boxes out, Solomon, I, I had uh, the top deep was all but about the, the the bottom two or three inches was all honey. And then the bottom two or three inches was, was, uh, dr was brood. The whole entire middle deep was side to side was brood. And then the bottom deep, had a bunch of brood in the middle, but then all on the sides, uh, like four or four total frames was all drone brood capped. And uh, I had to destroy two of those drone brood cell or combs to get them out of there. And I'm telling you, those bees like to kill me. And it's not their fault. It was just that was irregular equipment. Uh, the gentleman that I took his hives over does not believe in putting that nail in, in that last nail in your frame where you don't rip the top of the frame off. So, uh, have you ever had that happen to you when you're mid inspection? <laughs> pulling the pulling the top bar off of a frame, yeah. Yeah, off of a massive three deep colony when all you were counting on doing was swapping out a box. Oh my gosh, it was a disaster. Yep, I've but been those, there. it wasn't because they were mean. Um. Uh, so I don't know. That's something that people need to really think about when they get into beekeeping. You know, I can't – even if you're only going to have a couple hives, there's really good reason to have at least one place five miles from your house, if you can, that you could keep some bees for a little while. It's a useful thing to have. And, uh, you know, if you got some of these bees that act a little funky, see about getting them there or maybe get a beekeeping friend that can do that. Because uh, some of those genetics, you just never know what you're weeding out unintentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, if I don't have any experience in Africanized zones, 
But I can't help but think that that's going to take an, an attenuation process over time. And I believe you're going to have to work hot bees for a little while. And over time, I, I believe that working those bees, you're going to get back to where they're going to be a manageable bee again. And I don't know if killing queens just because they're hot gets you there quicker. Uh, I, I know I'm not having to deal with that, and there might be people who disagree with that, and that I don't have to deal with that. But I do know here that where there's hotter bees, that I catch hotter bees, <clears throat> when they come to my breeding yards, and I'm doing these breeding yards now, I got four of them, where I'm, I have uh, some of my traditional hives that I have from 2011 and 2012 that have just lived in these monocrop zones and given me honey. I've actually moved them to locations where I am going to just, uh, I'm not going to make them make uh, honey for me. I'm just going to make them swarm. And I have saturated the areas around them with traps and uh, already had uh, three of them hit this week. Uh, and they were in those trapping zones and they're all big and the bees look very similar to some of these bees that I brought into these zones. So. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff you can do with this, and uh, I don't know. I feel like we're skimming the top, and I I it always I always get a lot of uh, a lot of questions, and I before you ask some questions, uh, I've got like a frequently asked questions reference on my page that goes through everything uh, up to and including like moving them. Uh, one thing that I use at night, and I've I've gone to this when I move bees I, I I do this all at night or super early in the morning and uh, during swarm time where I live it's very humid and even when these swarms go in these boxes if it's hot they'll want to be on the outside so go to the store and buy a spray bottle get a larger capacity one and uh, put it on fine mist and when you when you go approach these traps and they're full at night just spray a fine mist on the front of that trap and take be patient with them give them a you know two or three minutes to go inside but they'll all go inside you don't need to use any smoke and it doesn't seem to aggravate them they all go in you can close your trap door and get get on down the road where you need to go speaking of closing trap doors i recommend disc entrances I think somebody commented on the Facebook group about how they liked your entrances. Yep, those uh, those are really nice. Uh, I, let's see, I got mine from Kelly, but I do I have seen that other places are carrying them. Look for get whatever best price you can. If you're super cheap like me, I uh, make them out of old canning lids too. You know, the disc entrances are very very nice, and I I highly recommend you use them. Uh, you know. A lot of beekeepers just get out there and try to find some old equipment like that, or or get something. You know, I've I've had good luck making them out of making these traps out of new equipment, so or you know new new wood. So you know, if you get a, if you got some boxes uh, and you're not using them because your bees died, you know, try some of that old black comb. Uh, be very, we're very fortunate in our country. I was speaking to some people in Australia, and do you know that they're not allowed to hang old comb in a box uh, and use that as an attractant for swarm traps? I did not know that. Oh, it totally bummed me out. I told them, you know, the true American in me says that then my next question would be, you know, what happens if I get caught doing it? You know, what's the repercussion? How bad... <laughs> What's that's it going to cost me to get out of that? That's you know? a very American sentiment. I mean, it's here. I don't know whether, you know, what their major pest is, but, you know, where I live, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the, whether the bees, whether it's exposure to these neonicotinoids or what, but I put these combs out and they'll be out all summer and sometimes wax moths don't get in them at all. And uh, they're still occupied by bees. My bees don't seem to succumb to any of these things. 
Uh, I have I've found that single frames of comb like that will usually not get wax moths. Where you'll get wax moths is where you have a whole box full of combs. Yep. And you'll come back after a few weeks and it's just full of webs. But a single comb, sometimes you get like one or two moths and they'll you know they'll chew one or two trails in the comb, but usually not. Well, and I've got several that I use. Uh, over and over, uh, on my site I talk about how I uh, I freeze my comb. Yeah, I'll just uh, use old boxes and put it in a contractor. Uh, and I I do believe in not using chemicals, but freezing those old brood combs. Those to me, in my beekeeping uh, operation, that is the most valuable thing because that is how I catch these bees. Uh, so if you are cleaning out dead outs even take the time i take the time and i clean dead bees out of those uh just to keep them so that i can uh freeze them and then i'll store those in a mouse proof area i keep them in my garage uh, and i try to keep you know eight or ten deeps of those around so that i can bait these boxes and uh, you know if you're a beekeeper the goal is not to have every single one of your hives live you're going to have attrition. That's just part of anything. You know, nobody opens a place of employment and thinks they get their employees hired and never, ever has an employee leave or a new employee come. So it's imp- it's impractical the way a lot of these beekeepers approach this today, you know. Uh, you're going to have bees come along and you're going to have bees die. And sometimes it's going to happen. But you go through and you ca- you, you, you reap these these uh, bait combs and treat them like the gold they are and uh, you know if you don't want to make swarm traps toy around with uh, getting some of these bottom boards uh, get an old bottom board and uh, screw it to the bottom of an old deep and uh, put your old comb in there and nine foundationless frames carry that in your car just for swarms and uh, put an LGO bait in there. Um, last year, I wish I would have had video of this. Uh, I there was a big swarm that was uh, in. It was behind a building at, on my farm, getting out of the wind, and I started to walk into them before I realized what was going on. And, and as soon as I started walking into them, I was the highest thing around, and they started settling on me. And so I like got the hell out of there because I was afraid they were all going to land on my head and I ran over to the car pulled one of those these catch boxes out and took it over into the middle of him and threw it down on the ground and that whole swarm just converged on that box over the course of about five minutes and just went right in it and I baited it like a swarm trap you know if you're uh, if you're uh, put off by hanging these things out Put them in a location where they're in some shade. You can catch them on the ground. This whole next week, I'm going to be putting up pictures of swarms I've caught on the ground over the last two years and dispelling a lot of these myths that you read. Uh, you know, I've read all the stuff about the Arnott Forest and that these bees are found at a mean height of so high. That's great. But I'd rather you get a swarm trap out there at whatever height than to worry and then to not do it for that because you're going to catch bees. If you put them out, if you put these out there, I have found I never hang them higher than what I can stand on a bucket ever because sometimes they get too heavy. So don't hurt yourself with them. How many are you going to get up, man? <laughs> uh, I need to get some more up. Well, get them up and... The, the one last thing, uh, and then we'll see if you got any more questions for me. Don't be hesitant to leave them out there. Where I live, this year is the oddest thing ever. I've, ne- I've never really had a lot of luck until the middle of May. But this year we had some crazy wonky stuff happen in the spring. We had some very prolonged bloomed of purple dead nettle and uh, henbit and white top. They all uh, bloomed uh, magnificently and for a long period of time. And I think a lot of these uh, 
these bees brought in a lot of nectar from that, and they're swarming now. But I leave my traps out until the 1st of August. And I, I, I have heard other podcasts, and, and these people talk about swarm season like it's three weeks in May. And that is only part of the story. Uh, something I am seeing, Solomon, uh, I have a lot in my operation what I call high hive number uh, high hive number hives that as I have a sequentially numbering system that I use that kind of helps me determine where through the season I caught the bees you know as I catch them the sequence of numbers goes up so you go back to like 11 uh, 2011 I have 1109 1110 and what I'm doing is later in the year in June and July I'm catching virgin queens, and those virgin queens, if they, if you catch a large swarm that has a virgin queen that then overwinters, I'm telling you, you have the absolute most productive bee colony that you're going to get. Uh, I don't care if you, who you buy your nukes from or whatever, and I, I mean, it, it will astound you the productivity you can get out of them when you, when you you know, utilize them like that. So uh, they're they're going to be coming into the prime of their life in that second season. Just by putting them in a box and not doing anything, Mother Nature lets you find out whether they're going to be productive. They're going to be productive if they can overwinter that first year. And then after that, it's just gravy uh, because they, they seem to just live. I've got a lot of high number hives, uh, 1208. Uh, is a is a really good hive that is a consistent producer, and uh, I don't know. You just see things emerge like that, so don't give up and uh, leave your leave your traps out there. On my website, I've got pictures of a ton of feral uh, hives that I take pictures of. I I take pictures of a lot of them that are at the base of trees. So if they're going to hit at the base of a tree where I live, then they're going to hit a box on the ground so you know get it out there and and catch a bunch of them because it's the best investment that I've by bar none the time that I've invested in swarm trapping is the best investment I've I've done in beekeeping it's I mean people say free bees but it's so much more than free bees it's especially if you're starting or you have low numbers and you're trying to expand um those bees are valuable if you're going to spend what over a hundred dollars on on a package in some places um, one and a half times to double that for a for a nuke I mean freebies are much more than free bees I mean it's making you money right there the what's the old saying a penny earned is a or penny penny saved is a penny earned oh I mean, absolutely 150 bucks saved is 150 bucks earned I could go for that. Yep, and it makes for a busy couple weeks. Uh, what what I have, what I'm experiencing here, is uh, you have pulses of activity. You uh, what what typically happens with me is we have a rain, then it gets hot and humid, then uh, the swarms that are at that stage will go ahead and and swarm, and that makes for a crazy couple days for me because I will be out all hours of the day and night trying to gather these things up and uh, I tell you what man I, I have gone I, I have only bought two hives of bees actually I take that back I bought four I bought two established colonies and two packages of bees and I have I always had a high number of bees die that's one another thing that all these beekeepers that are on Facebook and listening to the show don't get discouraged when bees die I have I have I'm not proud of this. I know this sounds weird, but I have killed a lot of bees. I've learned a lot of lessons. The key is when you kill bees to learn from it so you don't do it anymore. But, you know, don't be afraid to get out there and get to doing something, getting something done. And uh, one thing that holds people back is they're afraid their bees are going to die. Well, if you can go out there and you can reasonably assure yourself you're going to be able to catch five or ten swarms of bees in a year – you're a lot less likely to worry 
about trying to feed these bees and to treat and, and do all this stuff when, you know what, you might want to go spend time with your family or do something fun. Uh, to the point now, I'm, I'm catching bees and I'm, I'm getting them five at a time. So I'm, what I'm doing now is, is I'm only establishing yards that I can take 10 hives of bees to. So it makes it worth it to me. And I'm doing this without spending money on bees. I'm having good overwintering success. Everything keeps getting better. If you can't tell from talking to me, I'm having fun. <laughs> I mean, is this is fun. Sounds good. I mean, you are, those of you that may not be part of the Facebook group, check into it because Jason's on there and he is a wealth of information. And we've been having a bunch of posts lately about catching swarms. So that's what kind of precipitated this podcast recording. So uh, let's just look a couple of questions we have left or I had left. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit about the timing, about keeping the hives out there all season. I think that's a great idea. Um, I was kind of got kind of stuffed up this year because I moved the last two weeks of March and uh, didn't get my traps out as early or, or, or ready as quickly as I wanted to. And I, I still don't have them all. I've got, what, four, six of them sitting in the garage right now that are loaded and ready to go, just need to go hang up somewhere. Um, well, hey, just a little pointer. Uh, just instead of having them in your garage, try to get them to where your wife won't kill you if you, they get occupied. <laughs> and uh, just have them babies sitting outside. I already have a couple sitting in the backyard, so good deal. Um, it's weird. I had like uh, almost thirty of them sitting out there the other day, and the, it's weird. They pick one, and I don't. That's I'm very analytical. Uh, I am constantly trying to figure out, uh, you know, why this, why that, and it is so odd that they will zone in. All those will be there, and they'll zone in on one particular trap. And uh, it, I will typically, every day when I, I'm on my way home from work, I'll put up several traps, and they'll uh, they'll hone in. And uh, so in the mornings, I'll say, which trap should I leave out there? And she'll say, well, you need to need, leave number 10 because they were taking a lot of hits. You know, a lot of scouts were looking at it. Uh, so you never know which one it's going to be, and always as a beekeeper be looking at that but yeah if you get traps that was something that i didn't learn until the second year i kept traps i would have them all loaded up in the garage and then i started putting them out and it was like holy crap i had uh, three or four swarms of bees coming in on on you know separate days uh, and you know up until this year I had always said previously that I could not get bees to come into places where I had good, strong, established colonies, and I have been able to break that this year. So, I don't know. Just I guess get them out there and find out where where they hit. If you have success, keep putting them there, and if you don't, move them. Awesome. But as as I said, scouting. You know, anytime you go anywhere. Uh, as a beekeeper, you need to be hyper vigilant about paying attention. When you go to gas stations, uh, look in the trash because people throw away sugary drinks. If I, that's how I've gotten onto trapping in a certain part of a certain town that I live by, is I was at a gas station and uh, I look over and there's honeybees going nuts in this trash can. That's not the best thing for them to be eaten, but it is a tell. So then I'm, I'm racking my brain for family members, friends, and I've got traps there and I've, I've, I've caught bees in that location and they're, they're pretty daggone good bees. So as you're out and about, it's just another thing to be paying attention to. You know, uh, when I take my daughter back when she went to dance, when we'd be walking into dance, I looked down at the little town that we were taking her to dance in and there's bees on the flowers on the ground and I'm like okay well there's a brewery uh close to here and I know him and I got a I got a swarm trap up at the brewery so always be looking around and trying shooting any angle you can to get a swarm trap out there 
And it, I'm telling you, it makes it fun. It has made it to where I've met a lot of interesting people. It has really helped me with my beekeeping because, you know, your best ambassador for beekeeping is going to be some uh, partial stranger that sees a swarm come into one of your traps. They're going to tell all their friends, and their friends are going to want traps at their house. And, you know, it leads to where you got more bees coming in than you have to have to worry about. I, I just got 25 new bottom boards and 25 new uh, telescoping outer covers I got to get painted because I thought I'd have another couple weeks, and I'm, I'm almost out of equipment. I got to get that painted or I'm not going to have any place to put bees. Here's a here's a question for either somebody who's just starting who's never who's never trapped bees before or yeah. like me who I have not trapped bees here before because I've been elsewhere. I did keep bees here back from 2003 to 2005ish. So, but I I never really trapped here. What can I like? What kind of things should I look out for? What kind of density do I want to have the traps? How how far between traps? Um, any any kind of thing like that. When you're first starting out, I would recommend casting a broad a broad net. Make it like fishing. You want to in the beginning. You're just looking for good holes. Where where you live, you know, search some of these places out. Either. Get a place where you find bees. I would recommend not putting these up uh, in places where you see hives of, of bees. One, you know, if you don't know the people, it might it might piss them off. It might make them mad, uh, even though it really shouldn't. If somebody wants to come catch my bees, if they want to go to all the work to make a swarm trap and come catch my bees, I'm happy that they get them because they're going to get good bees. But what you are really looking for as a swarm cat trapper is you want the feral genetics because most likely if you get kept bees, they're going to be treated, fed. And they can make it for you, but you're, you're making a lot better play if you focus on places where uh, you're catching feral bees. So back to that, any time that you can think of places where there are cavities – where bees could live near you, wherever that is, you know, when you're listening to this show. Um, do little tricks like what, what I was talking about, you know, that it was an inadvertent thing. I was baiting traps uh, one day before my wife and I went to a winery with some friends from work. And I had inadvertently had lemongrass oil all over my hands. Well, we no sooner get into this winery, it's about uh, 45 minutes from my house, and there's honeybees all over my hands. Because I had a I had LGO on me, and uh, so use little tricks like that to find out if you if you got a friend that you think might let you put up a swarm trap someplace, um, take take some LGO over there and just dip a dip it on a cloth and hang it someplace and see if some bees come on a nice balmy hot day. You're gonna know. Um, cast a broad net, you know, have them in varied locations then when you find them hone in on them and and uh where you live just like where i live just like fishing you're gonna have an emerging pattern they're gonna they're gonna be there i they are too resilient of a species to not be there uh unless lemongrass oil smells really nice so it's not the worst thing to have all over yourself no, but it is annoying when you're at a winery and you're trying to eat food and go oh, through a yeah. food line. <laughs> Good point there. And I'm trying to stick finger foods in my mouth, and I'm trying to keep from sticking bees in my mouth because I just couldn't, I couldn't keep them off me. I kept on going in the restroom and washing my hands. But, uh, you know, by the time I bait as many and I'm around that stuff, and back then I was doing the old thing where I was getting it on my hands and smearing it on the – you don't need to do that, man. You put uh, – myself i'll be talking about this on my blog but all of those ziploc bags that i use i reuse those every year so reuse the same ziploc they'll get all scoty looking but you can open them up put a little more lemongrass oil in them they smell like swarm i think they i think they do better year after year after year 
And those, all of those bags, you want to be careful with them. I guard those kind of like my comb. I will gather all those at the end of the year when I bring all my swarm traps in, and I'll freeze those to keep moths from getting in them. Because for whatever reason, I do not know what the deal is. Moths love to eat those bags. Uh, they eat the plastic uh, wow. of, the, of the my little trap bags. So I don't know what that's all about. I, I tell you what, I have no trouble with any wax moths. The only only thing that wax moths ever cause me is if I'm stupid and I leave a dead hive out, which I've got two of them out there right now that I need to get, but I just haven't had time. Well, that's all the questions I have. I know it's getting pretty late where you are. Do it you is getting late. Anything uh, you want to wrap up with? Well, man, all I uh, like I always say to you, man, uh, I like what you're doing, getting out there, trying to get get the word out to people that you don't have to do beekeeping one specific way. And uh, more and more and more people are having success doing it alternative ways. And uh, no matter what you settle on, look at some of these things that other people are doing, uh, stuff like what I'm doing, stuff what you're doing. And, uh, man, it's, it's, it can be so much more fun than treating them like patients all the time. Yep, that's true. And I've got, <clears throat> I've got some stuff going on right now. I'm going to be doing, um, my queen rearing and splitting. I've got my, uh, my queen rearing box out on the hive right now. I've just moved the bees to a new location right next door to where I had them, uh, which is nice because I'll have a nice open field for myself. So I don't have to worry about any other, anything in the way and it's behind a locked gate. So even better, um, well, thanks, Jason. I appreciate yep. uh, you staying up late to uh, talk to us about this tonight. Um, I'm going to get this podcast out. Like, I'm literally going to stay seated here until I get this thing out because um, I've just got done moving. And last time I moved, I didn't I didn't post a podcast for three months, and I really should have. So this will be the one that's getting out. I'm not going to let an entire month go by, or at least the month of April. Um, anyway, uh, if you want to support the podcast, please do me a favor and schlep on over to iTunes and leave a review, preferably positive, but whatever you can do. Uh, if you want to support the podcast monetarily, you can check that out at patreon.com slash TFB. Please do subscribe to the podcast. If you're listening to it some other way, you can find that at either, um, either at iTunes or at tfb.podbean.com. Do check out our Facebook page. Facebook, just search for Treatment Free Beekeepers. We've got mid 8,000s of members now. It's getting pretty big. Um, we also got the Treatment Free Beekeeping Forum, which is at forum.tfbs.net. Um, I have been Solomon Parker, and my guest today was Jason Bruns. Uh, he's our Midwest uh, swarm-catching guru. You can talk to him on the Facebook group, and I will have all those references in the show notes at the Podbean page, so you can look up the books and other stuff, his, his website and blog and whatnot. And that's it. So have fun keeping bees, because if you're not having fun, you probably shouldn't be doing it. <laughs>